So it's time to take a moment and see where we're at. So we said uh, a few classes back that we're on this roadmap. And we spent one day talking about sequences, and, and that's sort of a, a long list of numbers. And oftentimes when we talk about sequences, the big question is, well, what can we say about the end of the list? In other words, what happens to the values of the numbers at the end of that list? And then we talked about series, which says, well, let's add up this long infinite list of numbers. And if we do that, okay, so that can produce a, a, a value of some sort. And uh, well, we've been spending a lot of time. And, and so we've survived sort of the like, uh, kind of weird part of this topic. So our point that we've gone to now is that in many cases, we can look at a series and say, hey, I can say, yes, there's an answer or no, there's not. But right now we've been thinking about these as adding up numbers. So today we go to our next stop, power series. And now what we're going to do is essentially we're going to introduce this X. So we're now going to have sort of a variable floating around. And we're going to think of this as sort of a, the, a polynomial going on here. So you should think of power series as a huge, big, infinite polynomial. And uh, that's setting us up in a couple of lectures. We're going to get finally to our real destination, which is Taylor series. But again, that's to come in a couple lectures. So today, well, we're going to think of a power series as a big infinite polynomial. So I have a, a sum. We usually started at zero. Uh, we almost never start at negative values. Uh, it's okay if we skip the first few values. Uh, sum from zero to infinity of uh, some number c sub n, we think of the c's as acting like the coefficients, x to the n. So c0 plus c1x, c2x squared, so forth and so on, dot, 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 dot. All right, so in some sense it's like, okay, it's a big infinite polynomial, all right, I, I can get that. Um, are there any series that we know? In fact, there's a good one that we know, which is the geometric series. That says the sum n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n is 1 over 1 minus x as long as x is not too large. Size of x is smaller than 1. Now, this is important. You are going to get a lot of usage out of this one. So you should know it. So if you're taking your notes, which of course we all take good notes, you should put a box around it. And then you should put maybe a smiley face indicating that working with this geometric series makes us happy. Uh, this person is a little bit drunk and happy, but that's okay. They're still happy. All right. So uh, what else can we do? Well, notice that right now this polynomial, it's all in terms of x. We can think of this as a polynomial where we're centered at zero. Well, we can really center around any place. So, so we can talk about being centered at x equals a. And what that means is instead of having our expression as a polynomial with terms involving x, it'll be a polynomial with terms involving x minus a. So c0 plus c1 times x minus a plus c2 x minus a squared and so forth and so on. And there are some reasons why we, we might want to do that. All right, so now we have the basic idea. A, a power series is an infinite polynomial. And of course, what you can do is, if for any particular value of x, you can plug it in. And then what you have is your power series is just a series where you're just evaluating because it's just numbers. So in, in some sense, uh, a power series is just a, a huge number of series that sort of all fall into one general family. Now, what do we care about? Well, there's two big questions that we have coming into play. So... The first big question is, can we simplify this expression? So in other words, I have this sum, this nice big infinite polynomial, cn times x minus a to the n. Can I find a nice, easy expression that doesn't involve an infinite sum? And uh, there are reasons that in some cases we might hope to do that because we've already seen a case, namely the geometric series. Now, the other question is, well, suppose I have this sum cn of x minus a to the n. Well, when does it converge? And in particular, when we're asking this question, the real question is, you know, for which x 
does this make sense? So that's what we're asking. So uh, when we're talking about convergence, you can say, well, look, I can write down anything, but of course it might be nonsense depending upon what values of x I choose. I don't want nonsense. That's not why I came. I want sense sense. And so the question is, of course, what, what, what can we do? So again, if you go back to the problem, or rather, excuse me, the, the one we just boxed, the one that we said we're happy about. See, here's a case where the sum of x to the n, the answer to the first question is, hey, look, it simplifies nicely. It's one over one minus x. So that's what we mean by, can we make it a simpler expression? The answer to the second question, when does it make sense, is this part. So in other words, when x is sufficiently small. So these are the two different answers for this particular series. All right, so let's uh, do another example. Simplify the following sum and determine for which x it converges. So we have the sum n equals zero to infinity of minus one to the n over two to the n x minus two to the n. Now, notice here that everything is really something to the nth power. So one of the things we can do right away is we can say, hey, I can think of this as the sum n equals zero to infinity of minus one times x minus two all over two raised to the nth power. And uh, <clears throat> Well, okay, I'm just gonna think about it as that way for now. Now, why do I care about that? Well, if you go back to our geometric sum, you can think of it in the following way. The sum from n equals zero to infinity of something to the n is equal to one over one minus something when our something in absolute value is less than one. Now, you'll notice here, I've, I haven't put an x, and I don't want to put an x. What I want to think of this is that there's this mold here, and that I really have freedom to put whatever I want there. So it becomes a question of, what's in the box? What's in the box? And so that's how we want to think of our, our series here. So you want to say, okay, what's our mold? And how do we use it? Now, in our case, the what's in the box question, we look for what's being raised to the nth power. And that's the part that's being raised to the nth power. So we can say, aha, applying what we know about geometric series, we get the following conclusion. So this will be equal to one over one minus this expression so minus one, x minus two over two, when this term minus one, x minus two over two is less than one. So I'm applying what I know to this case here because it, it still applies. It really is. You know, one of the reasons why we use the symbol x is it's sort of like it's the unknown thing. So x itself can be changed. It's actually one of the big themes that, that we've seen in mathematics is let's change what we call things. And if we do that, it really gives us a lot of power. Now we're not done, let's, let's push it a little bit further. Okay, so what are some things we can do? Well, suppose I wanted to clean up this expression. Well, one thing I can do is I see a minus and a minus. Those would multiply. Okay, that's good. I also see a fraction in a fraction. I, I don't like fractions within fractions. So let's multiply the top and bottom by two. So if we do that, we're gonna get two on the top and downstairs we'll get two plus X minus two. Okay, so that's, we'll, we'll work on that a little bit. And this will be true when? Well. Now notice when I take the absolute value, the negative one doesn't do anything. And now I can multiply the two across. So when the absolute value of x minus two is less than two. Okay, so what can I do to this expression? 
Well, one thing I can certainly do, it's not a very hard thing to do. You see there's a two and there's a minus two, so those can cancel. So that's two over x. Now, the last thing is, well, am I satisfied with this? And uh, yeah, that's actually a great way to express it. So when absolute value of x minus two is less than two. Now there are other ways to express that. Uh, let's talk about how we would get a different expression. So when we say that the absolute value of x minus two is less than two, what we're really saying is that x minus two is between positive two and negative two. Now, if I want to get x by itself, I'd add two to everything. And I would say that zero is less than x is less than four. So that's a, a different alternative. We could say zero less than x less than four. All right, good. So now we have a nice expression. And there you go. All right, well, nice. What else can we do? Well, let's see. What's our next thing to say? So, we're going to talk about when do things converge and when do they diverge. Now, it turns out, this is uh, not totally obvious, but we're going to talk about it, is when we have a convergence of our series here, it converges in an interval. In other words, it's not like it's going to converge a little bit here and then it diverges and then a little bit here and then diverges and a li little bit here. No, no, no. It's always going to be just a, it converges here and then it's going to diverge out there. And so we're going to talk about what that interval looks like. And so pictorially, the way you should think of it is that we have our real number line. So here's our real number line. Sometimes we denote this with a, a big bold R. And remember we, we used the word center. So it turns out that when I have this form x minus a to the n, at x equals a, you are always going to inner, sorry, you're always going to converge. 100% guarantee. Can you see why? Look at that expression. Why are we guaranteed that it's going to converge at x equals a? Well, when we plug in x equals a, what do you get? You get a minus a, which is zero. And zero to the n, except possibly for the very first term is zero, which means it's going to converge because you're adding up zero infinitely often. And if you add up zero infinitely often, it converges. So we're definitely going to converge. And now what's going to happen is that we're going to go out some distance. So we're going to talk about the radius of convergence. So the radius of convergence says that you come out some distance, capital R, in each direction. And so you have these two points that are distance r away. In between, this will always converge. So it's always going to converge inside of here. Outside, it's always going to diverge. And now you're probably thinking, okay, well, what about these points? And that's the question, is what happens there? And we're going to have to handle those separately. All right. So anyways, sorry. We're getting ahead of ourselves. So how do you find the, the radius of convergence? And the answer is the radius of convergence you find using either the ratio test or the root test. Every time you're looking for radius of convergence right now, you're going to pull out one of these tests. Now, what do you do? Well, you check and you say, okay, we know that we're going to converge when the limit of the n plus first term. So Think of this right here. This is our nth term. So see how we have absolute value cn x minus a to the n. Upstairs cn plus one, absolute value of x minus a to the n plus one. Now that's less than one. So we figure out, okay, we need this to be less than one. Or, well, if you rearrange it, there's a couple of nice things that happen. Uh, you can see that you get a lot of x minus a's to cancel, which leaves you with a single x minus a. And then you can move this term across, and when you move it across, you're going to flip. So it's cn over cn plus 1. In practice, we never do this. Uh, we'll, we'll do a lot of practice today, I promise. But uh, in, in practice, we uh, simply just take a look at this ratio. 
Uh, we should pause for a second here, and we should ask ourselves a question. And it's a good question to ask. Uh, so, why do we have absolute values? In other words, it's not just cn plus 1 over cn, it's the absolute value of cn plus 1 over the absolute value of cn. What's the answer to that? Do you, do you remember what's, what we need? Well, the reason we have absolute value is that's because in the ratio and the root test, we needed to assume that our terms are going to be greater than zero. And so in series, you can have terms which are negative. In fact, it's very easy when you have power series. If I pick same thing, say, where x is less than a, then this x minus a is negative, and you're going to get a negative showing up, unless by great coincidence, cn also is alternating sign. So that's why we have the absolute values here. You've got to be a little bit careful here. So anyways, we know it's going to converge when absolute value of x minus a is less than r. So it has to converge definitely all inside of here. By the way, the same root test says, well, it's going to have to diverge when absolute value of x minus a is bigger than r. That's why we know it diverges for sure out here. And then, of course, the question is what happens at the endpoints. The root test and the ratio test are both inconclusive. Okay, so anyways, here's the ratio test. Same idea, apply the root test. You have your absolute value of cn, x minus a, to the n to the 1 over n. Well, you get absolute value of cn to the 1 over n. Here, you get absolute value of x minus a, because the n to the 1 over n simplifies. So that's why you end up with an absolute value of x minus a. And here you get a limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over the absolute value of cn to the 1 over n. Which test do you use? The answer is you can use either. Uh, I will say that probably the root test is a little bit more popular test. And so if you don't know what test to use, you probably should start with the root test. Uh, do remember that you need a couple of things. For instance, n to the 1 over n goes to 1. There are times when you have to use the ratio test, do you remember? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's when you get excited. If you ever see a factorial, then you need to use the ratio test. Okay, so this is getting into our, our sort of interval of convergence, but we've talked about the radius of convergence. We can say, look, we definitely have our center at A. We can go out distance R in some direction. Now we have the endpoints. So if we're looking for the interval of convergence, we have a process. We automatically know the center. That's given to us. We don't have to do any work at all. We find the radius using the root or ratio test. And so by that stage, we know everything except these two points. If we're asked to find the interval of convergence, we have to finally say, well, what happens at these endpoints? Well, what we have to do is apply a test. It's guaranteed, 100% guaranteed, that the root and ratio test will fail at the endpoints. It has to fail. It's designed to fail at the endpoints, which means we need to have our other tests ready to go. The other test might be the nth term test, do the terms go to zero or not, the integral test, the comparison test, the limit comparison test, or the alternating series test. So that's why we need to have all those tests available so we can answer the question, well, when does this make sense? For what values of x does this make sense? All right. So, well, let's uh, try this out. Okay, so we'll do an example. In fact, uh, we're going to do a lot of examples. We're going to get really good with these. So, first one. Determine the interval of convergence for the sum from 0 to infinity n factorial x to the n. All right, so if we follow the process, here's our sort of mindset. We're thinking of this as our a sub n. So we're just thinking of it as x is now part of our a sub n. So I'm going to apply either a root or a ratio test. Which one do I need here? It's the ratio because of the factorial. So we're going to do the ratio test. We're going to look at the limit as n goes to infinity of absolute value of a n plus 1 over absolute value of a n. So this is the limit 
as n goes to infinity of, now we're going to have n plus 1 factorial, absolute value of x to the n plus 1, divided by n factorial, absolute value of x to the n. Now, the reason I'm only needing to put the absolute value on the x term is that's the only part that can be negative. So what actually happened there, we kind of did it without actually going through the intermediate step. There was an intermediate step where, for instance, on the top it was n plus 1 factorial x to the n plus 1. But then we said, okay, well, let us make the absolute value and just put it only where it's needed. So we said, well, n plus 1 factorial is never negative, so we can pull it out. And, well, x could be negative. We haven't ruled that out, so we'll put it there. Now, what happens? Well, what do we have? We get a lot of cancellation here, which is perfectly fine. Whoop, not total cancellation. Uh, it makes it look like all the x's go away. Uh, so, and there's some cancellation here, the n plus 1 factorial over n factorial. Well, that becomes the limit as n goes to infinity because you, you can pull off an n plus 1 here, and so this is n plus 1 times n factorial over n factorial. There's an absolute value of x left. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 1 times the absolute value of x. And remember, when we're applying the root test or the ratio test, in order for this to converge, we need this to be small, less than 1. So the question is, for which x is this true? Well, we run into some challenges here, right? Notice what's happening. We have an n plus 1, and n is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I have this really big term multiplied by the absolute value of x. Now, if absolute value of x is not 0, if I have a really big term times something which is not 0, eventually it's going to get ginormous. It's going to be huge. So what does that say? Well, it can't be true when x is not 0. Now, on the other hand, if x is 0, if I take n plus 1 times 0, well, it doesn't matter how big n plus 1 is, anything times 0 is 0. So it's going to be true. And the, so the answer is, it's going to converge at just a single point at x equals 0. So our interval of convergence is it's up basically the smallest possible inter interval we can have. It's the single point 0. So if you were to draw your number line, it would just be this one point. All right, now let's turn the tables. Suppose we want to know What's the interval of convergence for the sum n equals 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial? All right. Well, hmm. Will this be any different? Maybe. Maybe. So again, we start by saying, let's think of this as a sub n factorial. So we're going to still do a ratio test. We're going to take the limit. n goes to infinity of absolute value of a n plus 1 over absolute value of a n. So this is limit, n goes to infinity. So when I take the absolute value of the n plus first term, well, the only place where I need to worry about the absolute value is the x. So that's going to be the absolute value of x to the power n plus 1. Divide that by n plus 1 factorial. And of course, absolute value of a n is absolute value of x to the n divided by n factorial. Well, all right, we can clean that up. That's the limit. n goes to infinity. Absolute value of x to the n plus 1. Absolute value of x to the n. And then we have a n factorial and an n plus 1 factorial, which, of course, n plus 1 factorial is n plus 1 times n factorial, similar to what we just did. Now we get some nice cancellation going. The n factorials cancel. And we get most of the absolute value of x to the n's to cancel. So that's what's left is we have the limit as n goes to infinity of absolute value of x. Divide that by n plus 1. Now, 
our question becomes, this will converge when this is less than 1, so for which x is this true? Now, you'll notice the, the place where x shows up, there's no n attached to it anymore. And so, really, the, the question becomes, okay, what, what happens? Well, as n gets bigger and bigger, you're going to get a large denominator downstairs. It's going to be arbitrarily big. So even if you put in a huge number for x, say like a billion, in the long run, the downstairs, it's even bigger than a billion. Well, maybe a billion, 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 right? Uh, think of Scrooge McDuck swimming in his pool of, of money. No, it doesn't matter. Even, no matter how big the top is, the bottom is going to get bigger. Because there's a lot of space to, as you go to infinity. So, the answer for, to the question, for which x is this true, is it's true for all x. So, what does that say? Well, it says that it's the interval of convergence, so, see, the question is, when does this converge? Is uh, it's going to be uh, negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, in some sense, uh, what we see here are two extreme cases. So, if this is our real number line, then uh, our, we, we're centered at zero, but of course we get all numbers. Okay, so there's our, our nice interval. And the reason I said that these are sort of two extreme cases, if you think about your radius of convergence, so if you think of using capital R for radius, this is a case where the radius of convergence is zero, and this is a case where the radius of convergence is infinity. And uh, in those two cases, zero and infinity, you really don't have endpoints to worry about. So they're not quite the most interesting, and they're usually not going to be the kind of cases that we see, but definitely we've seen that they can happen. So uh, this is not a very nice function in far, in, excuse me, as far as we're concerned, it's not the kind of thing we want to deal with. On the other hand, it's going to turn out that this is going to be a really, really beautiful function. We're going to come back here and sing many glorious songs about it. Well, I don't know if we'll actually sing any songs, literally, but in our heart of hearts, we're going to sing its praises, because it turns out it's a very nice function. Very nice. So remember this series. You're definitely going to see it again, and then, of course, you'll see it on exams and quiz problems and homework problems. This is important. Very important. All right. Back to our regularly scheduled set of problems. All right, the next example. Determine the interval of convergence for the sum from 1 to infinity of negative x to the n. Divide that by root n. Okay, cool. We can do that. That's not so bad. I don't think it is. So, what do we have? Well, now you'll notice there's no factorials. And almost always when there's no factorials, probably the easiest thing to use is to use our root test. So, we're going to do our root test. Now, in some sense, there's sort of a process you should be thinking of. Uh, the process is, what's the center? Can you see where the center is? It's at zero. And uh, because when we're talking about the center, the center is we're looking for that x minus a. If there's no x minus a, then it's sort of like you have an x minus zero which means your center is at zero. The next thing is your radius. And then the last thing you do is your endpoints. And usually you, you have two endpoints unless you're in the two extreme cases we just talked about, which is zero and infinity. Okay, so the center is, is usually, it's a freebie. You don't even have to think about it. All right, so for the radius, we apply root or ratio tests. Almost always we're going to go with root unless there's a factorial. So, we're going to take a look at the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a n to the 1 over n. Because remember, we want to have non-negative terms. So that's going to be the limit as n goes to infinity. When I'm taking absolute value, let's think about where the absolute value comes into play. 
The square root of n is never negative, so that's not going to affect that term. It will affect the, the numerator, because the x could be negative, especially when you put a negative in front of it. So what's going to happen is when I take the absolute value of that, I'm going to have absolute value of x to the n. Downstairs I have n to the half, which is really square root of n. I'm going to raise that to the 1 over nth power. Well, that becomes the limit as n goes to infinity of absolute value of x to the 1 over n is absolute value of x, n to the half to the 1 over n. Now here's a, a case, whenever you have like n, and there's a 1 over n somewhere up the chain, it's really, you can think of it as n to the half to the 1 over n, but it's better to swap. The thing is n to the 1 over n to the half. And the reason we want that is n to the 1 over n goes to 1. So what we get is that in the limit, because this n to the 1 over n goes to 1, we end up with absolute value of x over square root of 1, which is absolute value of x. This will converge when that's less than 1. So that 1 right there is our radius. I'm going to say something. Be careful. Uh, but, but we should probably wait a little bit and see some more examples before we get too nervous about what it means to be careful. So our radius here is 1. You really want to solve for you know, what your goal here is you want absolute value of x minus a less than r. So if there had been a number on this side, we would have had to move the number across before we got the r. That's what I mean by be careful. Here, we didn't have to do that, so it was a freebie. So now, what does that say? Another way to think about absolute value of x less than 1 is to say, well, that's going to converge if we're between negative 1 and positive 1. So that leads us to the final part for the interval of convergence, which is the endpoints. The endpoints are these places here, the negative 1 and the 1. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what happens at these two points? All right, so how do we do those? Well, the answer is we now plug in. So let's start by plugging in negative 1. So we're going to take our value for x and replace it by negative 1. So minus minus 1 will be plus 1. So we're going to get the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 1 to the n, which is just 1 over square root of n. All right. Does this converge or does this diverge? And why? So we need to know what it does. We also need to know why it does it. So this will diverge. Do you see why? Well, because it's a p-series. It's a p-series and the power is smaller. If the power, because here this is the power n to the half, if your power is less than or equal to 1, it's going to diverge. So that says it diverges at negative 1, so we don't include. Because remember, what are we after? We are after the interval of convergence. Since it's diverging at negative 1, I can't include it where it's in the interval of convergence. I'm only including points where it will converge. So, how about x equals positive 1? So, you'll get minus 1 to the n. So, well, all right, 1 to infinity, minus 1 to the n, divide that by square root of n. Now, does this converge or diverge? Well, notice the big difference here is the addition of the minus 1 to the n. Now, when you see minus 1 to the n, you should be like, oh, fun, because we have a better test. Or maybe I should say there's a funner test. Alternating series. So this is a, a series where we alternate plus, minus, plus, minus. So we see the alternating part, that minus 1 to the n. Does the rest of it go to 0? Because those are the two things for the alternating series. Do I alternate sign? Do I go to 0? And it does, if you think about it. As n goes to infinity, the term downstairs gets big, the whole thing goes to zero. So this converges, and why? Alternating series test. Whoops, I'm almost going to spell alternating series test. 
Okay, now at this point you might ask the question, well wait, don't we need to say something more? Don't we need to say absolutely convergent versus conditionally convergent? And the answer is no. You don't need to worry about that. So when we're talking about the interval of convergence, we're not going to worry about whether the endpoints are absolute or conditional. Now, one of the things that's absolutely true is that, uh, just making a note here that we should include this point because it's where it converges. It's absolutely true that if you think of it as an interval, so we can sketch what this interval looks like. So we have our number line. We're centered at zero. Then we're going to go here to negative one and here to positive one. We don't include negative one, so we're going to use an open circle. We do include one, so we're going to include a, a, a closed circle here. And then we're going to have everything else in between. All right, so there's our, our, our interval of convergence. It looks like that. So this is, you can call this a half open, because we include one of the endpoints. Sorry, we include one endpoint, but don't include the other endpoint. So, uh, sorry, before I got sidetracked, uh, what I was trying to say was we're not going to worry about the endpoint, whether it converges absolutely or conditionally. It doesn't matter because we're just looking for where does it converge. We don't care about the type of convergence. It's always going to be true that inside, so, you know, once you move in from the endpoints, it's always absolute convergence on the inside. No doubt. No doubt at all. And the reason it's always absolute convergence is if you run back through your test for the root test or the ratio test, wherever the root or ratio test says you have convergence, it's always absolute convergence because what you're doing is bounding it by a convergent, absolutely convergent geometric series. So it's always going to be absolutely convergent on the interior. The endpoints may or may not be absolute. It doesn't matter. You don't need to worry about answering that question. All right. Next one, determine the interval of convergence for the sum from 1 to infinity of 2x to the n divided by n squared. All right, so what do we do? Well, really, it's going to be a very similar process. In fact, we're going to get so tired of this process, we're not even going to have to think anymore. That's when you know you really understand it. When you don't have to think anymore, it becomes automatic. Then it's like, okay, it's just inherent. So when you're talking about interval convergence, where's the center? It's at zero. What's the radius? Well, we don't know yet. We'll figure that out in a second. And what are the endpoints? Well, we really don't know that, but we'll, we'll talk about those in a second as well. Okay, so let's talk about the radius. We'll use the root test again. So root test, we're gonna say the limit as n goes to infinity of absolute value of a n to the 1 over n. So that's the limit as n goes to infinity of, now when you think of absolute value, the only place where the absolute value has any effect is what's attached here to the 2x. In fact, you can even pull the 2 out. So it's, uh, you could think of it as, well, I'll just say absolute value of 2x to the n. There's things you can do to that over n squared, and that's, of course, to the power 1 over n. So, what is that? Well, that's our limit, n goes to infinity, of uh, upstairs, absolute value of 2x, and downstairs we'll again do our same, swap the powers, n to the 1 over n to the 2. So, in case you're skeptical about what we're doing, if you didn't believe me last time, See, what's happening here is we have n squared to the power of 1 over n. So n squared to the power 1 over n. Well, really when you have a power to a power, that's the same as just multiplying the powers together. That's n to the 2 over n. But of course, that's the same as n to the 1 over n quantity squared. So whenever I have powers to powers, I can choose the order I take the powers in. And we always want to choose the order which is easiest for us to work with. Our goal well, we have lots of goals. But one of our goals is, let's make life easy. We want life to be easy. That goes to 1. And therefore, we see that the limit is 2x. And we want that to be less than 1. Now, is our radius 1? Uh, be careful. No. See, because 
there's that two there. So we want to be careful. So what we can do is, is we can put that two out. So we can say, oh, that's two absolute value of x is less than one, or absolute value of x is less than one over two. Now I'm of the form x minus a an absolute value less than a number. That's my radius. So my radius of convergence is one half. Put another way, I can say that negative a half less than x, less than a half, it definitely converges. So that means my two endpoints are at x equals minus a half, x equals positive a half. Now what do we do? Well, we're going to plug those endpoints in. Plug in minus a half. Okay, so minus a half times two will make this a minus one. So we get a sum n equals one to infinity of minus one to the n divided by n squared. Does this converge or diverge? Well, alternating series goes to zero, converges. Alternating series test. It actually, there's a better reason it converges, but uh, we'll hold off on that for just a second. X equals a half. Well, two times a half is one. So now sum n equals one to infinity of one to the n, which is one, divided by n squared. Does that converge or diverge? Well, it converges, right? Well, why does it converge? Well, the answer is it's a p-series. Now, I said that it converges by the alternating series test. There's an even better reason that it converges, or we should say there's a stronger reason, which is if you drop the sign, it's again a, a, a p-series, which converges. It turns out it's going to be absolutely convergent, but again, that's not a thing we need to know. So this is a case where we include both endpoints. So that's possible. It's possible to include both endpoints. It's possible to include one endpoint. It's possible to include neither endpoint. That's why you got to sort of check. You got to do the work. So in terms of the picture, we're starting at zero. We go out to a half, come out here to negative a half. And now we include both endpoints. So we're going to mark both endpoints. And then of course we have the part in the middle. And so that is our interval of convergence. There we go. That's what we look like. Cool. All right, we're getting the hang of this. Uh, another 100 examples, and we'll got, we have it down cold, right? Good. Well, maybe not 100 today, but well, we're going to have lots and lots of time to practice. Plenty of time. Plenty of time. Next example. Determine the interval of convergence for the sum 1 to infinity x minus 1 to the n divided by n. Okay, all right. Uh, hmm, what could this be? Now, one thing that's already different here is we have this x minus 1 coming into play. This is good. This is going to help us sort of understand a couple of things. So let's talk about our center. Where are we centered at? What value? Is it negative 1? Or is it positive one? Be careful. It's a positive one. Now, one way to think about what the center is, is you ask the question, for which value of x, if I plug it in, would I get zero out? Whatever the answer to that question is, that's your center. So in this case, we see that if we were to plug in x equals one, lo and behold, we would get uh, zero out. So that's why one is our center. Radius and endpoints, well, we got to wait, do the work, see what we get. Okay, so again, we're thinking of just the whole thing. That's our nth term. So here's our a sub n. And uh, again, I'm going to show my bias. I'll keep using the root test. Uh, I guess we could do a ratio test. You want to do a ratio test or a root test here? Maybe we should do a ratio test just to show you that ratio test can also work. And so that, uh, you know, I don't want to bias people too much. Ratio test is a great test. Root test, since we've done a couple of those already, let's do a, a ratio test, just, just for practice, right? And then you can make a, 
uh, decision. Which one do you like? Luminous n goes to infinity. We're going to have the absolute value of a n plus 1 over the absolute value of a n. So what does this become? Well, the only place where the absolute value is going to have any effect is in this term, the x minus 1. So when we talk about the absolute value of a n plus 1, that's absolute value of x minus 1. Whoops, absolute value to n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. And then 1 over the absolute value of a n is like I take the reciprocal n over absolute value of x minus 1 to the n. Now we can simplify. We can get some cancellation. Boom, boom. Ah, that feels good. Now, the n and the n plus 1 don't quite cancel, but they almost do. So let's see what you have. You have luminous n goes to infinity. You have a single absolute value of x minus 1. And then you have an n divided by n plus 1. Now notice the absolute value of x minus 1, that does not depend on n in any way, shape, or form. So that becomes absolute value of x minus 1. That just comes out. What happens to n over n plus 1 as n gets big? So like a million divided by a million and one. It becomes closer and closer to 1. So the limit is absolute value of x minus 1. So again, by the ratio test, this will converge when this is less than 1. So what's our radius? Our radius will be 1, because we're the right form, x minus a less than capital R. So our radius is 1. Now, what's our endpoints? See, previously when we did our, the last couple of examples, our endpoints were, oh, we just go out you know, from 0 in both directions by 1, because our center was at 0. Now our center is at 1, so we want to go 1 in both directions. So one way you can think of it is, if I start at 1 and I go 1 in both directions, I'll end up at 0 and at 2, because 1 minus 1, 1 plus 1. Another way to think about it is we can manipulate this expression. So I can say, well, drop the absolute value says that has to be between 1 and negative 1. Add 1 to all sides, 0, less than x, less than 2. And now we see that our endpoints are at 0 and 2. Okay, so the last thing to do is the endpoints, because we're doing the whole interval. Okay, so here we go. Uh, all right, so let's do x equals 0. So when we plug in x equals 0, what do we get? Well, we're going to get the sum, 1 to infinity, 0 minus 1 to the n, which is minus 1 to the n divided by n. Does this converge or does this diverge? And how do we know? We see alternating series at minus 1 to the n. We see the terms go to 0. If it alternates and terms go to 0, this will converge. And this will do it by the alternating series test. All right. Good. Which means that at x equals 0, we're going to include 0. Okay, how about at x equals 2? Well, that will become the sum from 1 to infinity. 2 minus 1 is 1. So we get 1 to the n, or simply 1 over n. Does this converge or diverge? Well, this one, we know that one. It's a really important one. This diverges. Well, how do we know that? Well, one way we can think of it is it's a p-series where p equals 1, but well, this one is even more famous than just a p-series. It has its own name. This is called the harmonic series, and it diverges. So at x equals 2, we don't include. And we don't include it because it's not going to converge. So remember, we are only going to, we're only going to include points where we get convergence. So if we were to sketch it, which we don't need to, but we might as well. So here's 1. That's our center. We go out 1 in both directions, 0 and 2, and we say, all right, we include 0, so we're going to fill the circle at 0. We don't include 2, so that's an open circle, and then, of course, we include everything in between. So that's our picture. I guess we should have also written the notation here, uh, so 
our interval is 0 less than or equal to x less than 2. So let's go back and do that on our other problems as well, just so we can see the variety. So this one here would be minus 1 less than x less than or equal to 1. And here we would have minus 1 half less than or equal to x less than or equal to 1 half. You can see here, for example, we may include the left but not the right. We may include the, the right but not the left. We might include both. So there's all sorts of types. So you, you can't just go and say, oh, it's always going to be we include this one and we don't include that one. You don't know. you got to do the work. you got to do the work. All right. Now, for the next one, determine the radius of convergence. Now, let's be careful here because if we weren't paying attention, we might get ourselves into trouble. Notice there's a key difference here. It specifies the radius and not the interval. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that uh, don't worry about the endpoints. Because when you're after the, the radius, we don't really care about whether the, the endpoints converge or diverge. Now, why do we do that? Well, because there are some sums where it's hard for us to figure out whether it converges or diverges. Even with all that we've already learned, even then, it's still tough for us to make our decision all the time. So, all right. So what do we do? Well, we follow our process. By the way, our center, it's easy to spot. We might as well mention it. It's zero. So we're thinking this is our whole sum. Here is our, our a sub n. Now, root test or ratio test. All right, this time, pay attention, be careful. We want to be using the root test. Because of that power, that n squared, if we were trying to make any sense at all with that, we'd, we'd run into trouble if we uh, did it as a ratio. But as a root, we can make progress. Let's also make a couple of notes. 1 minus 1 over n it's going to be greater than or equal to zero. So this expression, this really weird looking thing, one minus one over n to the n squared, it's a positive value. So the reason we mention that is we want to make sure we understand what to do when it comes to taking the absolute value of a sub n. Because we're going to take the absolute value of a sub n to the power of one over n. So the only place where the absolute value comes into play is on that x. So this will become 1 minus 1 over n, whoops, that's a 1 there, to the power n squared, absolute value of x to the n, to the power 1 over n. So this becomes the limit, as n goes to infinity, of, well, 1 minus 1 over n to the n squared to the power 1 over n. What happens to that? It's 1 minus 1 over n, but to what power? To the nth power. You multiply these together, n squared times 1 over n. Absolute value of x to the n raised to the power 1 over n becomes absolute value of x. Now this is going to be fine. That's just going to be absolute value of x. It doesn't do anything. What about this part? Okay, now I promise we have talked about this before. I, I, I swear to you we have. Okay, so do you remember it? 1 minus 1 over n to the power n. Yeah, uh, right. Okay, e to the negative 1. Now you're probably thinking, that's not what I was thinking. All right, where have we talked about that before? Well, here's a, a fun fact. So, and how do I know it's a fun fact? Because it says the word right there, fun, fun fact. So, this is that if I have 1 plus t over n to the nth power, that goes to e to the t. So when I look at 1 minus 1 over n, I can think of this as like a 1 plus a negative 1 over n to the nth power. So that's going to converge to e to the negative 1. So our limit here, this is 1 over e times the absolute value of x. And now, when we're doing the root test, this will converge to number less than 1. Now, is 1 our radius of convergence? No. See, the thing is, there's this term here, 1 over e. I need to get rid of it. 
or rather I need to move it around. Because what I want is I want to get the absolute value of x minus a on the left hand side. And I don't have that yet. But if I multiply through by e, I get the absolute value of x is less than e. Now this side, that's our absolute value of x minus a. And this side, well, that's our r. So our answer is our radius of convergence is e. Now that's not so obvious. It's not obvious at all that that's what the radius of convergence would be. So, well, good, good. We figured it out. And life is good. Life is, life is more than good. It's wonderful. All right, a couple more examples and uh, we'll hopefully be in good shape. Okay, so let's uh, kick it up a notch. Okay. Determine the interval of convergence. Oh boy, this is more than a notch. Uh, sum n equals 1 to infinity, 27, 2 minus x to the power 3n, divide that by 8n to over root n. Okay, so, hmm. <clears throat> Definitely there's a lot of stuff going on here. Let's be a little bit cautious here. Let's pause for a second and ask ourselves the following question. Will 27 have any effect to our final answer? What do you think? Yes or no? Mm. Turns out the answer will be no. The reason why 27 won't have any effect is it's a constant. You could, even at the very start, just say, hey, let's pull a constant out of our sum. We won't do that, but you could. It turns out the 27 won't make any difference. Why do they put it in there? Misdirection, I suspect. They're trying to see if we're paying attention. Well, they can't catch us. Well, hopefully not. At least not today. So we're going to think of this as our a sub n. All right. So, uh, again, let's go back to our, our, our root test. And uh, let's talk about a few things. So we have our, uh, our center, our radius, and we also have to do our endpoints. And once we've done all of that, then we'll, uh, we'll know our interval. Okay, so let's start. Do you see where our center is at? So can you see the center or can you be centered? Um, <clears throat> do you see it? All right, the center is at positive two. Now, You'll notice here, you gotta be a little bit careful because they've written it in a weird way. See how they've written it as two minus x? Normally we'd wanna write that as x minus two. Oftentimes the easiest thing to do to find the center is just ask yourself the following question. Which value of x, if I plug it in, would give me zero? Whatever the answer is, that's your center. In this case, uh, since it's two minus x, if I wanted to get zero, I'd plug in x equals two. All right. This will also show up, by the way, by the time we, we get to answering the radius. So we're going to do our root test. And so our root test says, take a limit as n goes to infinity. We're going to have our uh, absolute value of a sub n to the power 1 over n. So that's going to be our limit as n goes to infinity. So we have 27 to the 1 over n. We'll talk about that in a second. The absolute value, the only thing that's going to affect is that 2 minus x. I'm going to write that as absolute value of 2 minus x. And uh, that's going to become cubed. Uh, you can see I'm, I'm also sort of like skipping an intermediate step here. I hope that's okay. So I'm, I'm taking the 1 over nth root of everything here. So because it's the product, I just do it of every individual term. 8n to the 1 over n. We'll leave us with eight. And then the square root of n, it's similar to what we did before. So I'm gonna think of that as n to the one over n to the half. So I took the nth root of every term. Now, 27 raised to the one over nth power. What happens to this as n goes to infinity? Well, we're gonna get 27 to the zero, which means that this is gonna to go to one. On the other hand, this term down here, n to the one over n, 
to the half. What happens to that as n goes to infinity? Well, that's also going to go to 1. So what we end up with is absolute value of 2 minus x cubed over 8. Now, in order to converge, we need this to be less than 1. All right. So let's uh, talk about a couple of things. Um, what's our real goal? Now, our real goal here is we want to somehow do some work, and we want to make it look like absolute value of x minus a less than r. And if we do that, then that r that comes out, that's our, our radius. So uh, let's move the 8 across. So that would be absolute value of 2 minus x cubed is less than 8. Notice that this is a cube. I don't, I don't have a cube up here in this absolute value of x minus a. So I, I want to get rid of the cube. The way I get rid of a cube is I use a cube root. So I'll take the cube root of both sides. Now I'll say absolute value of 2 minus x is less than the cube root of 8, also known as 2. Okay, now it's really close, but notice it's like 2 minus x. I'd really want it to be like x minus 2. So how can I change 2 minus x into x minus 2? And the answer is, I just do it. Now you're probably thinking, ooh, that's cool. We can just start doing stuff, right? Well, okay. Why am I okay doing this? Why am I, have I not cheated? Well, the answer is, if I compare 2 minus x to x minus 2, they're almost identical. The only difference is the sign. But because it's an absolute value, then the sign doesn't matter. And therefore, I'm okay. Now we're in the right format. Absolute value of x minus 2 less than 2. Which means that our radius is 2. Good. Now we've got our center and we've got our radius. We can even talk about our endpoints. Now we can find them in two ways. We can either go from our, our center of 2 and go out 2 in each direction. Well, if you go from 2 and then go 2 to the left, you're at 0. If you start at 2 and go 2 to the right, you get end up at 4. The other way to do it is to start from this expression. You say, well, that's really the same as saying x minus 2 is between 2 and negative 2. Whoops, whoops. Ah, not absolute value anymore. Just parentheses. Add 2 to everything, 0 less than x, less than 4. All right. So we now need to do our endpoints. So x equals 0. So if we do x equals 0, we're going to get the sum. n equals 1 to infinity. Uh, there's a 27. 2 minus 0 to the 3n. So that's 2 to the power of 3n. Divide that by 8n square root of n. Now, if you do your job right with the radius of convergence, this should be something which is really kind of a borderline case. In other words, definitely there should be nothing that says, ah, this clearly converges by a root test or a ratio test. And you're looking at it like, well, there's a bunch of exponential stuff, but stare closer. 2 to the power of 3n. What's another way to think of 2 to the power of 3n? I'll give you a little bit of a hint here. 2 to the power of 3n is the same as 2 to the 3 to the n, also known as 8 to the n, which means those two exponentials cancel out. So what we end up with is we end up with the sum from 1 to infinity of 27 divided by root n. But again, the 27, it's a constant. You could have moved it out. So don't really be, get distracted by that 27. What do I have here? 1 over root n. Does that sum converge or does it diverge? And how do we know? Well, it diverges. How do we know that? Because it's a p-series. Okay, so what does that tell us? x equals 0. We don't include all right, good. So now we know don't include 0. How about at x equals 4? Well, we'll get the sum, 1 to infinity. And what do we have? We'll have 27. 2 minus 4. Well, 2 minus 4 is negative 2 
to the 3n. Divide that by 8 to the n over root n. Now let's be a little bit careful here. Now, if I think of negative 2 cubed, that's really the same as the sum from 1 to infinity. I can cube it, that's 27, negative 8 to the n over 8 to the n square root of n. Because I'm taking that negative 2 cubed. Now, be careful here. If I have negative 8 to the n divided by 8 to the n, what do I end up with? I end up with a negative 1 to the n. Now, we like that. Because we like having that negative 1 to the n. Because that says, hey, there's a fun test. When you see that, you say alternating series. Okay, I'm alternating. Does everything else go to 0? And uh, 27, now that's just always 27, divided by root n, that goes to 0. So this converges. And how do we know? Well, we know because of alternating series tests. And so that says that we're going to include 4. That is part of our interval of convergence. So in terms of our picture, we'll do a quick sketch. So here's 2. We go 0. We don't include it. Go out to 4. We do include it. And then, of course, we include everything in between. So that is a picture of our radius of convergence. And then if we just write it in interval notation, 0 less than x less than or equal to 4. Which, by the way, if you want, you can also write open parentheses 0, comma 4, close parentheses. This is another notation that people have for intervals. Use whatever notation you're comfortable with. We're not here to test you on notation. Sometimes you'll see both, depending upon what context you're in. Uh, but we really want to make sure you get the right answer. That's, we really value that. We like that. We like it when people get the right answer. All right. So, final example for this lecture. All right. Determine the interval of convergence for the sum, 0 to infinity, k times x plus 3 to the power k. Divide that by 3k plus 1 over 3 to the power k. All right. Hmm, 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 as they say, hmm. Well, let's uh, think about it. Okay, so we're going to do the whole interval. Where's our center at? Our center is at, is it 3? No, it's not 3. What is it? It's negative 3. See, the reason it's negative 3 is what x do you have to put in to get 0? It's negative 3. Another way to think about it, is that you can think of it x plus 3 is really x minus a minus 3. So that's why it's negative 3. See, that's x minus a. Okay, so there's our, our center. We have to do our radius, and uh, we do need to get our endpoints figured out. Okay, so again, uh, we'll think of this as our our a sub k, in this case, it doesn't really matter, right? This is k equals 0 to infinity. The, the, the notation n or k, it doesn't matter. It's an index. It can use any symbol you wanted to. You could even put little smiley faces here. If you did, you'd go crazy having to draw lots of little smiley faces, which is why we don't do it. But you could do it, but we're not going to do that. Okay, let's see what we have here. Do, 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 do. So, uh, well, we get uh, limit because we're going to do a we're going to do a root test. As k goes to infinity of absolute value of a k raised to the power one over k. All right, so there's where we're going. So, hmm, that's a. Uh, the limit as k goes to infinity, and uh, maybe we should think about this for a while. So the only place where a negative could show up is that x plus 3, so I'm going to write that x plus 3 to the power of k. Downstairs I'll think of it as 3k plus 1 over 3 to the k. And raise that to the power of 1 over k. Now, uh, let's think about what's happening here. 
So that's the limit as k goes to infinity. I'm going to think of the, the, the polynomial part. So that's k divided by 3k plus 1 to the 1 over k. And then here, the rest of it, it's actually pretty simple. It's absolute value of x plus 3 and 3 because I have to the kth power, to the 1 over kth power, that just gets us tilting to the first powers. The only hard part is thinking about, well, what happens here? What, what does that do? Well, let's sort of think about, we have uh, the inside and the exponent. Now, what does the inside go to? k over 3k plus 1. As we get larger, k over 3k plus 1 goes to 1 third. And 1 over k goes to 0. Now, what's true about 1 third to the 0? The answer is, it's 1. See, this is not one of our indeterminate forms. What do I mean by it's not indeterminate? So, if I had 1 to the infinity, or if I had, say, uh, infinity to the 0, or maybe even 0 to the 0, these are what we call indeterminate. That means these are the more work. Now, basically, if you don't have that, you don't need to do more work. And we don't have that. We have something to the zero power. A number to the zero power uh, is one. And so we don't need to do more work. So, so what's our limit? Our limit is the absolute value of x plus three over three, and that needs to be less than one. Because that's what the root test says. Well, we move the three across. Absolute value of x plus 3 has to be less than 3. Now we're in the right format, because this side right here, this is our absolute value of x minus minus 3. So there's our x minus a less than r. So our radius is 3. You might notice that in a lot of our examples we've had so far, our center and our radius are about the same size. Not in every case, but in, in many cases, um, that we've done. That is not always going to be the case. Do not read too much into that. So the reason we're doing that is just because there's some subtleties when, when some of the numbers are similar and we just want to be careful. So again, don't try to, to make guesses. Your goal is not to guess the right answer. The goal is to find the right answer. Okay, so where are our endpoints at? Well, if I started with this expression, that tells me I need x plus 3 to be either below 3 or above negative 3. Subtract 3 from everything, negative 6 less than x less than 0. And we could also have gone that saying by start at the center and go 3 in both directions. If I go up by 3, I get to 0. If I went down by 3, I'd get to negative 6. Okay, so we have two endpoints to check. And once we've done that, we're good to go. All right, so let's plug in some points. So uh, we plug in x equals, uh, let's start with three. Sorry, let's start <laughs> three. That does, no, that's terrible. We can't start with that. It's gotta be either negative six or zero. Let's start with zero. Okay, when you plug in zero, what do you get? Zero plus three to the k. Oh, well, that's easy. So that's the sum k equals 0 to infinity. See, we're going to get 3 to the k upstairs, 3 to the k downstairs. So we get k, divide that by 3k plus 1, and that's it. The 3 to the k's cancel. Now, does this converge or does it diverge? Got to think about that. Uh, what's a good test for us to use? k over 3k plus 1. Well, uh, if we think about this term right here, we'll call it our b sub k. We want to use a slightly different notation here because it's not the same term up here. What happens as you take k to infinity of this b sub k? What do you end up with? Well, you end up with a third. And now you're probably thinking, aha, a third, that's smaller than one. And no, no, that's the wrong thing, right? What, what test are you doing when you're asking the question of 
What does the term do? What's the test? That's the nth term test. Now, do you know what the nth term test says? The nth term, nth term test says, look at the limit of your terms. In this case, it would be the kth term test, but all right, semantics aside. Does it go to zero? And if not, well, what does it mean? So here it goes to one third. Turns out, true story, one third and zero are not the same. Therefore, it diverges. So, do we include zero? No. So we'll put frowny face. Hmm. Hard to tell that's a frowny face. Maybe, let me try that a little bit. There we go. There we go. That's a def definitely, that's a frowny face. We don't include zero. All right. Well, how about uh, negative six? Aha, negative six. Maybe that's our clue, right? So sum k equals zero to infinity. Now, negative six plus three will be negative three. You'd have negative three to the k over three to the k, which will produce k over three k plus one. The three to the k over ne sorry negative three to k over three to k becomes negative one to the k. Good. Alternating series test. Ah, we love alternating series tests. It alternates, and so this will. Oh, wait, we've got to be careful, right? What do you have to check? Does that go to zero? No, it goes to a third. We just said that. So this does not converge. It's actually, again, it's the nth term test. It's the same test. The nth term test says, look, it doesn't go to zero. Now, in this case, the limit of the whole thing, it doesn't go to a single number. It actually sort of oscillates between one third and negative one third. And so, uh, again, this is a divergent one. So this is a case where at neither endpoint do we diverge. Both endpoints are bad. So that's why, you know, it could be the case that both converge, both diverge, one, one converges. And so anyways, the picture, our center is at negative three, go out to zero and to six, and they're both open because we're not going to include either one, but we will, of course, include everything in between. So we always include the things between our endpoints. So our interval of convergence will be from, uh, whoops, that's a negative six, negative six less than x less than zero, or we could write that as parenthesis negative six comma zero, whichever way you want to write it. And that's it. And uh, okay, good. So all the tests that we did in the last week or so really was helping us get up to the point where we could say, all right, I can kind of start to tell when do things converge and when do things diverge. So we're starting to develop our feeling for when do we have these infinite polynomials, for which values of x does a particular infinite polynomial make sense. And of course, we're getting really close to that point where it's like, hey, can we start doing some calculus with these polynomials? And that's of course what we're gonna do next time. Oh, good times, good times. It's gonna be exciting and we'll see you then. All right, have a good day. Bye.